Luke chapter 24, if you would. So you're finding your place in Luke 24. I was just talking to Sidney Murray before the service, and you know he's been struggling with some pain. He's uh, fallen and uh, had some issues. He's supposed to get a stimulator put in Friday. He asked me specifically to mention that for prayer, so I appreciate your prayers for that, that it would do the job, and that the procedure would go well. He's had a lot of struggles with that, so hopefully get him around a little bit better. He's got a few miles on him, but uh, he wants to get a few more, so if you would pray that that'll uh, be effective. If you'll find your place in Luke chapter 24, I want to read a passage here. We've looked over a number of weeks at this theme about walking with God, and I want to bring it, hopefully, uh, to a final message this morning as the Lord directs and hopefully bring this together for us in some, uh, somewhat of a practical way. So as you find your place in Luke chapter 24, I'm going to read a text there in just a moment, so let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity again this morning to open up the Word of God, and yet at the same time, we recognize our dependence upon you to speak to our heart. There's nothing in me that could be a blessing or challenge our hearts this morning, but I believe the Spirit of God could take the truth and challenge our hearts for the glory of God. I pray that you would show anyone who doesn't know Christ this morning his or her need, that they might come to receive you, that we as believers could be brought closer to you, and that the Lord Jesus could be magnified. We thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Luke chapter 24, if you look down first of all to verse 13, this is following the resurrection of Jesus, and the disciples are still somewhat in the dark, though they shouldn't have been, but it says in chapter 24 and verse 13, that behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about threescore furlongs. They talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now, of course, in their mind, he's been crucified. They've heard a report that he's risen from the dead. They've not yet seen him, but he shows up along with them. But in verse 16, their eyes were holding that they should not know him. So he kept himself, though he was physically there, they didn't recognize it. So they believe a stranger has come along, and he says to them in verse 17, he said unto them, What manner of communications are these which you have one with another, as ye walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answered and said, Are thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? Hast thou not known the things which are come to pass in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. And we trusted it, been uh, he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Well, Jesus begins to speak with them, not revealing yet who he is, begins to explain some things and deal with them. And then if you'll move down to verse 31... It says, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened unto us the scriptures? Now these men were in the process of physically walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. Though to some extent they uh, did not know that, They recognized after they had walked with him that there was something about him. They couldn't see him with the physical eye, but when they listened to his words, they recognized that when he left, they said, you know, we didn't even think about it. But while he was walking with us and while he was opening us the scriptures, our heart did burn within us. Now, these men had become a little discouraged. They had watched what took place when they saw the Lord Jesus on a cross. And as they mentioned, we thought it was he who would redeem Israel. Well, you know, he is the one who's going to redeem Israel. We thought when he went on the cross that something would happen. There's no way he's going to stay up there. We just couldn't believe that he was going to die. Well, they didn't realize that, yes, he was going to die, but he was going to rise again. They knew that Jesus had spoken even about going to Jerusalem and the third day. And he said, now the third day's taking place. And we had a report that he, that he rose from the dead, but we hadn't actually seen him, and they were totally discouraged about it, and they were down, and they were focused on their circumstances. Now, understand these men had not turned their back on the Lord. They were not done with serving God. 
They had not determined to say, we're not going to follow the Lord Jesus anymore. They just couldn't get their arms around what had happened because they had a different plan than God did. Well, Jesus comes and begins to question them and begins to show them what really took place. And he doesn't even uh, tell them who he is personally. He just says, let me point you to the scriptures. And they begin to see the picture. And they begin to realize, wait a minute. This isn't what God was doing, and he expounds the plan. And then when they realize what's happened, Jesus shows himself physically and then vanishes. And they said, did not our heart burn within us when he opened to us the scriptures? You know, we've talked about walking with God, and of course we use that phrase often. We've looked at some different principles in the Bible that have to do with a walk with God. And what do we mean by that? We're not talking about simply a matter of meditation and reflection that helps you to relieve stress. Many times when people look at meditation and they think of it in a secular way, it's something there just to give you sort of an inner peace. And there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. There is no peace apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. But to think of peace in the sense that I'm not stressed out, I'm not worried about what's going on outside, I'm going to look inside, I'm going to meditate and think, and we can easily, if we're not careful, merely Christianize that and add scripture to it and still have the wrong focus. We're not simply trying to reach a place of reflection and inner peace. We are trying to cultivate a relationship with a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when I walk with God, yes, there's going to be some meditation. We've talked about that. Yes, there's going to be reflection on the truth of God. We've dealt with that. And certainly that is important. To walk with God is an analogy that obviously the idea is not just physically moving, but to every day I talk to him, he talks to me, he directs my steps, I'm anxious to hear what he's got to say. We walk together like Abraham, we talk to a man like a man talks to his friend. Now, these men, in a sense, unwittingly, were walking with God. And you know, sometimes even when we're not walking with God, And Jesus is still walking with us. Thank the Lord when we don't necessarily see his presence, he's still watching over us as he did here. But you know what happened is these people began to listen. Even though they were themselves discouraged, even though they themselves thought maybe their walk was not that productive, as they began to listen to Jesus, they made an admission. Did not our heart burn within us? Let me tell you, when you walk with Jesus, the result is not simply that you might reach some place of tranquility and inner peace and say, well, I just feel better. When you walk with God, the Lord will stir your heart. Your heart will burn within you. It'll give you something, not just an emotional charge, though your emotions might be affected, but it will do something in your heart to stir you to something for the Lord. Now, I noticed the process that Jesus went through with these men that is very similar to what we all at some point go through. I want you to look down to verse 25 and notice now as he's talking to them, they said, we, we, we heard a report. These women said they saw Jesus. We've not yet seen him. We don't really know why all this took place. And in verse 25, he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? You know the problem these men had, and Jesus here is, first of all, in this first step in the process, is he begins with a rebuke. Now, I know fools is a strong word. He's not speaking to them as fools and that they're lost, or the fool that says in his heart, there is no God. But what was foolish? What was he rebuking? They were simply approaching it from a logical standpoint. Now, what God does is not illogical, but understand what God does transcends logic. You know, if we have a mental perspective, if we simply back up and say, look, two plus two has always got to be four. That's true in mathematics. But if God wants it to be five, it can be five. You've got to put the supernatural element into it. Don't just try to approach it and say, look, I am well-rounded. I've seen a lot of things take place. I know human nature. I know how people respond. I know what takes place when certain elements are introduced. And so I know how God has to do this. No, God might just have a different way than you thought he was going to accomplish it. Now, they saw this. We know Jesus has come to redeem Israel. 
Our plan is he would come, he would do these miracles, he'll defeat the Roman Empire, he'll set up a kingdom, and even to the final moments of the cross, we're watching and we're thinking, he's going to come down. Boy, something's going to happen. And they watched him die, taken down, put in a grave. Well, boy, I didn't plan that. And then even when they heard reports of him being raised from the dead, they thought, well, that's encouraging, but I, I haven't seen him. I mean, I didn't know he was going to do that. You know, you've got to be careful that you don't approach God's business from merely a logical standpoint. Again, it's not illogical. It just transcends logic. Now, I have read uh, some comments. Someone who was basically just criticizing Christians and uh, approach to witnessing and people that would try to tell folks about Christ. And uh, as one of the arguments was brought up, somebody objected. They said, well, the problem with Christians is they use the Bible to prove the Bible. That's circular reasoning. So uh, I take the Bible and I tell you that God created the heavens and the earth. Well, how do you know that? Well, because Genesis 1-1 says God created the heaven and the earth. Well, now, you're just using the Bible to prove that the Bible is true. That's, that's circular reasoning. Now, let me pause for a moment and tell you the exact same people that are saying that. Tell me this. I go into a museum. I see a, what looks like a bone, a big dinosaur bone. And they tell me that that dinosaur bone is 40 million years old. And I say, well, really, how do you know that dinosaur bone is 40 million years old? Now, this is an educated uh, person. He's a Ph.D. He's been to college. He understands all of this. Now, there may be some other factors, but he looks at this and he says, well, that bone was found in a particular stratosphere of soil. I mean, you go to you know, Grand Canyon or whatever, and you see all these layers of dirt. It was found in that layer. Now, we know that that layer of dirt is 40 million years old, and there's a bone in it, so what does it make sense? A dinosaur obviously died when there wasn't any dirt on top of it. He fell down, and that bone, of course, his body decayed, and the bone was left there, and then all of that soil got piled over there. Now, not to confuse you, he didn't explain to me how 10, 12, 15, ever how many inches of dirt it was piled up over hundreds, millions, thousands of years, and that bone didn't rot. He didn't explain that part, but either way, it slowly, gradually got covered with dirt. That happened 40 million years ago. That soil piled up. That stratosphere we know is 40 million years old. So it's logical. If there's a bone in it, and it's covered with dirt that's 40 million years old, the bone must be 40 million years old. Well, that makes sense. If, the, if that dirt's 40 million years old, and there's a bone in it, it must be a 40 million year old bone. So that makes a lot of sense. Let me ask you this. How do you know that layer of dirt is 40 million years old? Well, it's obvious. There's a 40 million year old bone in it. I mean, it's got to be. Now, you laugh, but that's what they'll tell you. Now, of course, yes, are we carbon date the bone, which, by the way, is not a bone, it's a rock. It's been completely replaced. What used to be there is not there. It's been replaced by minerals, and it just looks like a bone where it was replaced by minerals. But either way, they authoritatively, having been to school for eight years, been educated beyond their intelligence, and tell you, hey, it's 40 million years old, and they use circular reasoning. You say, well, aren't you doing the same thing, just taking the Bible to prove the Bible? No, they're missing the point. We don't claim to try to convince you logically that what God says is true. Our point in using the Bible is we say, hey, we believe a higher authority said it, therefore it must be true. I believe in the authority of this book. I have no uh, desire at all to, from apologetics, try to mentally demonstrate to you that Jesus rose from the dead. I simply proclaim that he did, and I expect God to convince you that it's true. Now, he'll do it. God will honor his word. He'll back it up. But you know, if I'm not careful as a Christian, I can begin to approach things and say, well, it doesn't make sense. What God does is never nonsensical, but it doesn't always to us make sense. Now, Jesus rebuked them. Do you know when you walk with God and you're seeking uh, to cultivate your relationship with him and you get along and you sometimes move, lose your sight, lose your perspective, start looking at your outward circumstances Hey, I've done it, you've done it, we've all looked at the, the circumstances, but sometimes we need to get back on track a rebuke. The Holy Spirit rebukes us. He rebukes us as we open up the Word of God. He rebukes us as we come to the house of God. You know what happens? A person gets cold, they get indifferent, and they wake up in the morning and they say, I'm just discouraged. I don't want to go to church. 
Well, the very place where God might speak to you and rebuke you and put you back on path and get your perspective back on is the first place the devil doesn't want you to go. He doesn't want you to be exposed to preaching. He doesn't want you to be around other Christians who might be in a good mood. I mean, he doesn't want you to get exposed to what might cause you to say, wait a minute, what am I looking at circumstances for? I need to be looking at him. But that's what happened. They started approaching it from a logical perspective. But you know, it wasn't just a logical perspective. It was a limited perspective. Look at the phraseology they used when they were asked. In verse 21, when they were explaining to this person, they didn't know it was Jesus. It says, we, in verse 21, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. You know, there's one problem with that statement is the E.D., we trusted. You know, if you trusted Jesus in the past for what he said he was going to do, then it shouldn't be, I trusted him. It should be, I trust that he is the one that will do what he said he's going to do. You know, Titus 1 2 says, God that cannot lie promised eternal life before the world began. In Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Had he said it, and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Hey, you know what I have to find out is not what is the circumstances taking place. What I need to do is what did God promise would take place? If I find the promise of God, I can't limit God to what's taking place now. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. In that same book in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, now we see through a glass darkly. We, see a, we can't see it all. We don't have a clear vision. God doesn't have to give me a clear vision. God doesn't have to explain to me everything he's doing. God's got a plan that is bigger than my life. So the many times in our life when we walk with God, the process of having my heart stirred begins with a rebuke. I mean, sometimes we've got to be put back on track, don't we? I mean, sometimes we've stopped and say, what am I thinking? The problem is, I'm thinking. I've got to quit focusing on what's taking place, and I've got to start trusting. That's not blind faith. I'm not just blindly putting my head in the sand and saying, oh, everything will turn out fine. No, everything doesn't necessarily turn out fine unless I believe the promises of God. They had a limited perspective. So I see a rebuke. Then I notice, secondly, in verse 27, I notice revelation. So here's how he corrects them. He says in verse 26, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? That's the question. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He begins to explain to them from the scripture concerning himself. Now, what did they really need here? He rebuked them. He says, you're looking at the circumstances. Let me tell you what you need to be looking at. You know, we talked about when you walk with God, certainly uh, the scripture is at the center of that. I go to God. I begin to look in there. I begin to see him. I begin to seek the face of God. You know, sometimes we use the term devotions. You know, there's nothing wrong with the term devotions, but even heathen use the term devotions. I mean, anybody who thinks they go worship their idol, it's because there's a devotedness to your cause. It's good to be devoted. But what do we mean by devotions? You know, what we ought to really mean is that we're seeking God. We're looking in the Bible to find Him. I mean, there's plenty of folks who will go and study the Bible simply because they don't want to be ignorant of what God's going to do at some point in the future, and they're interested in the sensational aspects of it. Nothing wrong with studying prophecy. But when you open this book, you ought to look for him in it. Find the principles that point you to him. So what exactly? He began at Moses. Where's Moses? First book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. He began at Moses and through all of the scriptures and demonstrated himself. Now, Jesus didn't even begin to deal with all of their circumstances. He didn't say, you viewed this wrong, should have been like this, or this is what you mistake about. He just went back and said, let me show you. And again, he's speaking as a third party because they don't know who he is. He says, let me tell you about Jesus. 
Let me tell you today what will get you on a walk with God is a renewed revelation of who he is. Now let me tell you what this book tells us about Jesus. What if we went back to Moses? Do you realize it all points to the cross? It all points to this very thing they had just witnessed. It all points to this one culminating point in history where Jesus would be lifted up and put on a cross, and they were perplexed about it. So Jesus said, let's go back and think about it. First of all, he goes back, and he could demonstrate to them the need for Jesus. See, Jesus is not just a convenience. He's not just a crutch, somebody we look to in a time of difficulty, or some uh, mythological figure that we might just think it makes us feel better. He is the Son of God, and he came for a purpose, because the Bible demonstrates there's a great need for Jesus to come. All I need do is go back to chapter 2 of the book of Genesis when God put man on this earth and he said, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof, get it, thou shalt surely die. He promised them that their sin, their rebellion, if they turned from what he said, death would be the result. The Bible still says that the wages of sin is death. That hadn't changed. Man, because of his rebellion, sinned against God, has been separated from the Lord. Adam put in a perfect environment with every way in the world to succeed, determined not to do what God said, and it got passed down to all of us. We have the same bent, the same uh, tendency, and yet we ourselves choose to sin against God. You can see how that turned out. Their first child that came along murdered by his own brother. You can see that beyond that, the descendants of, of Cain and so forth came along. And during the flood, the place came so bad that every imagination of man's heart was only evil continually. You see, beyond that flood, you think, boy, man will learn his lesson. God judged the whole world and everybody died except eight people. Surely they'll catch it. They come off of that boat and within a hundred and a few hundred years, a man named Nimrod stands up in rebellion. We don't need God. We'll build a tower. We'll bring everybody together. God let them build it part of the way and confounded their languages, ended their work, and sent them out again. He judged them. I mean, man has always thought, I'll do it myself. I'll do it the way I please. And he tried every type of God, every type of idolatry. Look, read through this book, and you're going to see that man needs God. It shows a need for a Savior. What would this world be like had Jesus never come? Can you imagine no influence from this book? No changed lives by the Holy Spirit. No way for sin to be forgiven. No way to have hope for eternity. I mean, religions have tried to give it. They give no hope. The Son of God came and accomplished it. He finished the work that it needed to happen as he takes the Scripture and begins to explain to them that the Scripture showed a need for Jesus. It didn't just show his need. It demonstrated his suffering. You know, they're looking for a Redeemer. They're looking for a King to come. He's going to come, but they had overlooked the suffering. He says, you remember? You disciples know the Bible. Don't you remember when Adam and Eve sinned against God, what God did? He slew two animals. Oh, they tried fig leaves. That didn't do the job. He slew two animals and shed blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. God had to provide them robes that day, which was a demonstration that only God can provide righteousness. You started at Moses, and he worked his way through. He demonstrated Abraham up on top of that mountain. He was going to offer his only son, Isaac. And God provided himself a lamb for a burnt offering. He took them to the law and demonstrated all the five different sacrifices and said, don't you know they all point to me bleeding on that cross? Hey, you go to Isaiah 53, and he begins to, Who hath believed our report, to whom of the arm of the Lord has been revealed? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. They could see the bloody stripes laid across the back of Jesus with that whip and thought about his stripes Wounded for my transgressions. That's what Jesus said he was going to do. He took them to Psalm 22 and said, Don't you see here where I cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As that psalm opens up. Because thou art holy. He said, I laid on that cross and cried, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because the scripture demonstrated I would take the sin of mankind upon myself. Do you see how that pointed out that I would have hands and feet that were pierced? How my bones would be out of joint? 
how that day all of the suffering that I would go through was prophesied in the Bible. And he led them through the scripture and said, Ought not Christ to have suffered and to rise from the dead? Psalm 1611, Thou will not leave my soul in hell, nor suffer thine holy one to see corruption. I mean, I can see these men that day as they walk. They're walking down. They're discouraged. They're thinking about, man, this didn't turn out well at all. And we had this thing figured out, and we thought for sure the Redeemer had come. Now he's dead. And then, of course, these ladies are saying he rose from the dead. That's kind of hard to believe. I just can't figure it out. And this man comes alongside. Hey, what's wrong with you? Well, didn't you, hadn't you been around? Didn't you see what happened to Jesus? Isn't it amazing? Here's two people who saw the same event. One says, didn't you see what happened in Jerusalem? And they're discouraged. The other man, who is Jesus, they don't know it, says, didn't you see what happened in Jerusalem? And he's encouraged. See, the whole idea is which side of it are you looking at it from? Are you looking at it from man's side? Or are you looking at it from God's side? Man looked at the cross and said, what a defeat. God looked at it and said, what a victory. Jesus bore the sin of all mankind upon himself that day, bore our judgment upon himself, made it possible for folks to escape hell. He made it possible that day for a man to have peace in his heart. They're looking at it as, boy, this didn't turn out right. And God says it was a victory. Now, he gave them a revelation. Let me tell you what we need this morning as a Christian. It's so simple. Certainly, if you're lost today, if you don't know Christ, there's nothing you desperately need more than to receive this Savior who died and rose again for you. You won't get to heaven by joining a church or by living a better life or turning over a new leaf, but you come to him just as you are. Come to that Savior. He'll save you. You say, well, preacher, that's good. I, I did that years ago. I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. I know I'm, I'm, Jesus has took away my sin, but what about this walk with God? If God spent the whole Old Testament and new pointing to one historical action of Jesus on a cross and rising from the dead. I mean, all of the revelation of God points to it. All of the New Testament looks back to it. What do you think my perspective ought to be as a Christian? Is I ought to stay focused on the cross. I mean, that's not just a platitude. That's where our power as a Christian lies. That's where the defeat of the devil was accomplished. That's where my salvation was claimed to point us back to the revelation of himself. Now, there's much to know about this person, this one that we serve, this one that was lifted up on the cross. But he says, if he be lifted up, he'll draw all men to him. Now, that means he'll draw lost people. But God's word is very precise. If I lift him up in my own heart, if I remember what he's accomplished, see, Really, what is it that I'm going through that would discourage me like these men are discouraged? What would knock me off from walking with God? What would take away my stirring more than forgetting the fact that Jesus secured everything on that cross? He gave them a revelation. So there was a rebuke. Then he gave them a revelation. But then notice, as we did in our text, there was a renewal. Verse 31 it says, Their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. This is a unique passage in that here they are talking to the Lord Jesus. He's in his resurrected body, and they don't recognize him. Now, the problem was not with Jesus. The problem was their eyes. Their eyes were holding. They, they couldn't physically see him. And do you know, I can't physically see him. I can't see Jesus physically. They couldn't either. They didn't have to. It didn't say after they physically saw him, their heart burned. When they couldn't see him at all, their heart burned. You see, it was not God's will through this whole church age that we'll physically see him. The next time we see him physically, it'll be when the trumpet sounds and we meet him in the air. Or if you go out before that, absent from the body, present with the Lord. But to see him in this age was not his will. We have something greater than that. I mean, I can see now if I got a little discouraged, well, I just need a visit from Jesus. I just wish he'd come down. I could see him physically and talk with him. And I'm not saying God doesn't have the ability to do that. I mean, he could be in many places at once and still be him. 
But that's not way. He did something better than that. He stays with me all the time. He lives in my heart. Do you believe that Jesus lives in your heart? If you're a Christian, I'll pray the Father. He shall give you another comforter, even the spirit of truth which the world cannot receive. He came and moved in. I mean, he came and lives in my heart today in the presence of the Holy Ghost. They had the presence of Jesus. They just weren't aware of it. After they became aware of it, they said, you know what? I didn't even know he was there. But when he started talking to me, it stirred my heart. Let me tell you, you don't have to get focused on what am I going to do for God. You get focused on how can I walk with God and then be open for him to do something through you. He'll do something through you. He'll stir your heart. These two men were never the same anymore. I mean, after they saw him and their heart stirred and they recognized, what are we doing? Man, our focus is wrong. Their heart burned. They were stirred for God. Now, I'll tell you, we can grow cold. I've, I've experienced this. I can tell you from experience, you can get cold. You can get indifferent. That doesn't mean rebellious. That doesn't mean you quit coming to church. That doesn't mean you've turned your back on God. And it doesn't mean that we're always going to be on an emotional high. But God can stir you spiritually by walking with him. When you begin to walk with God, again, you talk to him. He talks to you. You get that perspective back on the cross. You put what's most important first. You start asking God to, to show himself to you and make you uh, focused on his promises. You don't even have to turn on the switch or think, okay, now next thing I'm supposed to do, um, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to have a revival in my heart. No, you just get right with God, and he'll stir your heart. I mean, it's his job. The Holy Spirit will do it. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it's so common that it can become almost... Uh, sort of a platitude, but it's the Word of God. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be a witness unto me. I had a man that I knew well, a preacher. I had a couple of meetings with him. I actually knew his uh, son. Uh, he's just a man I highly respected, and one of the godliest men that I ever knew. Wasn't a perfect man, but he just really walked with the Lord, and anybody who ever met, it, met him knew it. He was telling me one night, and you have to hear the story and know him. He was not boasting by any means. He was explaining something. And again, at this point, he's, he's an older man. I'm just a young preacher. And he was telling me how he was in college, and he was really starting to just you know, seek the Lord and talked about a particular book that he read that had stirred them, that pointed him to certain scriptures he had never seen before. And he said, I, w I started studying this thing. And he said, the Lord got a hold of me on a couple of specific promises in the Bible. He said, man, I ran up. He's in college. He said, I had to go up to the classroom building. And he said, I went in a room by myself and I became so emotional. And again, he wasn't saying seek his experience. He was just relaying this. He said, it overcame me so much. He said, I had to pray God would hold his hand back. He said, I got so stirred. Now, listen, I've never experienced what his man experienced. And I'm not telling you to seek an experience. What I'm telling you is he wasn't looking for the experience. He began to walk with God, and God got a hold of him in such a way that it stirred him. Well, now that was when he was 20 years old. I've never met a man of the like of a soul winner of this guy. And he was not uh, such an outgoing personality. That wasn't his, his, he just, I'm telling you, the guy was so soul conscious. And just to talk with him, you got the idea. You ever had somebody, if you, you thought to yourself, if I want to ask somebody to pray for me, he's the guy I want to ask to pray for me. This was the guy. He got phone calls all the time from people, and he would tell them, hey, I'm not, you know, people that know how to pray know that. Hey, I'm, it's not me, but yeah, I'll pray for you, but and you better know I'm not, you know, anything special. But the guy knew how to pray. I mean, God stirred his heart. Do you know you want to walk with the Lord like that, and I do too. I want a renewal. I want a revival. I want to be stirred, but I don't just seek that. You seek the Lord, and God will do that. I mean, our responsibility is to walk with Him. Do you walk with God? I mean, you say, what does that mean? Again, are you seeking Him, whatever level you're on today? I'm not telling you how many hours a day that takes or uh, exactly the specifics, but it does take seeking him. And then when he shows you what to do, you do it. It starts with simple obedience in what he's, what he's revealed in his word. I read a story about a 
young boy. I, I got the impression from the story he was six or seven years old, and he was blind. Now, it seemed like, from what I was reading, he could see light and maybe a silhouette, so, but he just couldn't, he couldn't make out anything, so he was legally blind, just had never seen any kind of figures. The doctors realized from, somehow it was a problem with a lens or whatever it was, and he, everything else worked, and they found a way to make that boy see again, replace the cornea, whatever it was. He took this surgery. Of course, they had to patch his eyes for some period of time. For six, seven years, he'd heard the voice of his parents, knew who they were by speech. So that day came where they pulled those bandages off. And by the way, the surgery was complete success. Can you imagine what it was like for that six-year-old boy to match a voice with a face? I mean, what a what a stirring, what an emotional. Of course, the story mentioned how emotional the boy just couldn't even stop. He just, just hearing the voice and seeing, he just broke in tears. You can imagine how that would stir your heart. But you know, in a way, when we begin to seek the face of the Lord, we see now through a glass darkly, but the Spirit of God begins to reveal to us who He is. And when you begin to see Him, I mean, God begins to give you a nugget of spiritual truth. You begin to actually see a promise of God and it hits you. That's for me. God will stir your heart.